good morning and good afternoon and perhaps for some good evening and welcome to our World Rabies Day webinar titled Rabies in the U.S. Facts Not Beer. Um, my name is Rich Chipman and I'm a wildlife biologist with the USDA Wildlife Services Program I, and I serve as the coordinator for our National Rabies Management Program. I'm also going to be the moderator today um, for much of the session. Um, this webinar is a collaboration among the USDA Wildlife Services Program, the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, our industry partner, Bavarian Nordic, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And World Rabies Day is an annual global health observance that's focused on raising awareness about rabies and also brings together partners to enhance rabies prevention and control efforts worldwide. This September 28th will mark the 15th annual World Rabies Day. And the theme for this year's World Rabies Day is facts, not fear. So our goal over the next couple hours is to separate fact from fiction when it comes to the science of rabies and rabies management to protect human and animal health. To meet this goal, we've assembled an enthusiastic team of rabies experts, our true rabies warriors as we call them, who are gonna provide six presentations covering a wide variety of topics, ranging from the rabies risk associated with dog importation in the US to rabies management in raccoons, coyotes, and foxes. Before we start, there's a couple of housekeeping things that I'd like to uh, make you aware of. This webinar is being recorded and we'll be uh, making available for uh, this recording for viewing uh, after the webinar. It is a listen-only webinar, but we strongly encourage everybody to post your questions in the question box. Uh, if possible, direct it to individual speakers, but we're also very interested in any questions that are much broader, and we encourage you to do that as well. We're gonna uh, save uh, the answers to questions until during the kind of the Q&A discussion after the first three speakers, and then again, after the, uh, the last three speakers. If we don't get to your questions during the Q&A panel discussion, we're gonna make every attempt to answer questions through email. Um, after the fact. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Terrence Scott, who is the technical lead for rabies at the Global Alliance for Rabies Control. Terrence leads the team that coordinates World Rabies Day and has worked on dog rabies elimination programs and has assisted with the development and implementation of various rabies elimination tools throughout Africa and Asia. Take it away, Terrence. Thanks very much, Rich, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joined us from around the world. Um, so today I'm going to be kicking off um, this, this webinar with a bit of an overview about rabies um, and also just letting you know why, why we're discussing rabies. Uh, what is rabies, first of all, and, and why should you still be concerned about this disease, whether you live in a rabies endemic country or whether you live in a, a country that may be dog rabies free, in, in particular, following on uh, from the theme of this webinar, focusing on rabies in the US. So I'm going to give a, a broad overview to you, and then um, we'll go into more targeted uh, discussions and, and presentations from my colleagues. So I'm going to start off with um, zombies. Um, so in, in pop culture, we've seen a lot of uh, talk about about zombies. Um, there are lots of movies and lots of series out there uh, speaking about zombies. And typically, these zombie movies and series come from some sort of rabies strain that has been mutated or, or weaponized for some sort of reason, um, and it's it's led to the zombie outbreak. And we see that. I think the reason why uh, movie makers and and the people who make these series and and in pop culture, use rabies as, as an example is because it is such a horrific disease. It's, it's a terrible disease. It's 100% it's fatal. Um, one symptoms occur. And I think we can see many similarities about um, rabies and, and that of the zombie movies. But we here, as, as Rich mentioned, in terms of World Rabies Day, to address the facts 
about rabies and not uh, lead on with these misconceptions and misbeliefs. So I'm going to take you through a couple of the things uh, and some myths and misconceptions about rabies and then look at how we can address this global issue. So first of all, um, rabies won't turn you into a zombie. That is, of course, a myth. Um, that is something designed for the movies. But the one thing that they have gotten right is that rabies is entirely fatal. So it's, it's a fact that rabies is real and it kills thousands of people every year. In fact, it's, it kills about 59,000 people every single year. Also, um, we see in these zombie movies that there is no cure. Once you become a zombie, there's no turning back and that they've actually gotten right. So in terms of rabies, it's a fatal disease. Um, it's 99.9% .9 fatal once symptoms uh, appear. So once you're infected, once symptoms start manifesting, um, you, there is no treatment for this disease. But what we do see also in these zombie movies is that there is always some hero scientist who develops some sort of vaccine or, or means to, to stop this outbreak, to stop this global pandemic and to stop the spread of, of, of zombies. So even if you are bitten by a zombie, um, you may not get in fact infected. And this is something that, that we see with rabies too. Just like the zombie movies, rabies is 100% preventable. We have the vaccine available. The vaccine is effective. So we know that even if you get exposed to a rabid animal, you can be protected if you are vaccinated and if you get the right treatment at the right time. And we know that vaccinating 70% of the dogs in high risk areas can break the cycle of transmission. That means that we can eliminate the disease by making sure that animals and people don't get infected with the disease itself by being vaccinated and receiving the correct treatment. So rabies is a zoonotic disease. So that means that it can be transmitted from animals to humans. And I think most people nowadays will be aware of what a zoonotic disease is, um, considering the, the current COVID pandemic. So let's go more into a, a bit of the nitty gritty about rabies. So what is rabies exactly? So rabies is a virus um, and it can infect any warm blooded animal. So that means uh, you can get rabies in lions, you can get rabies in horses and raccoons and people um, and very, any other mammal can get infected with rabies. But that doesn't mean that they can all transmit rabies or that they are common, common transmitters of the disease. So rabies is also a disease that affects the brain and the nervous system. Um, and this is, this is where a lot of the symptoms come in and again, Taking those parallels with um, the zombie movies, it's a disease that affects your brain um, and causes these symptoms. Rabies is also a neglected tropical disease, which means that in general, uh, this is a disease that affects the poorest and, and most underserved communities around the world. So it's because it is preventable, we know how to prevent it, we can prevent it, but those communities that lack the resources and lack the ability to treat and to vaccinate the dogs and the people in those communities are the ones that are most affected by the disease. So dogs are the primary reservoir of rabies, um, of human rabies, of dog mediated rabies, of course. And in terms of dog mediated rabies, uh, they are responsible for approximately 99% of all the human rabies cases worldwide. So of those 59,000 um, human rabies deaths, those are caused by um, dog rabies reservoirs. And then you'll hear later on in, in the, the presentations to follow about some of the other variants of rabies and some of the other species that uh, transmit rabies and can pass it on to humans. So is rabies really still a problem? So I've mentioned that um, it kills 59,000 people, but many of you may not have even heard about the disease, or if you have heard about it, it's, it's something that you may have heard of in passing and it it's, shouldn't be something that's considered too serious. So in fact, what, rabies still kills one person every nine minutes worldwide. That means that during this webinar, approximately 12 or 13 people will have died of rabies. And 40% of those victims are children. So this is a disease that primarily affects um, 
children, as I said, in underserved and poor communities. So looking at the global burden of rabies, um, this, this map is a little bit old now, um, but you can see it gives a good idea of, of where rabies is prevalent. Those countries in blue, um, all the low and middle income countries throughout Africa and Asia, those are the countries that are still endemic for dog mediated rabies. The countries in orange um, have sporadic rabies cases and the yellow countries are those where rabies is, is mostly controlled. And then the green countries is where dog rabies um, has been eliminated. But that does not mean that there is no risk of rabies in those green countries. That means that there is still there are still cases of imported rabies into those countries. And again, you'll hear about this later. Um, and there's also wildlife reservoirs for rabies in those countries. So as I mentioned, rabies is 100% preventable. We can prevent this disease through primarily through the vaccination of dogs. Um, so by vaccinating the dogs, vaccinating that reservoir that's responsible for the majority of human rabies deaths globally, uh, we can eliminate the disease and prevent it from being passed on to humans. Um, there's also effective post-exposure prophylaxis, which means that like in the zombie movies, if you get exposed, um, your body can fight off the disease and you can be protected. And again, we'll hear about this for both rabies endemic countries around the world, but also for countries like the US where rabies is free, the importance of receiving uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis also, as well as ensuring that your dog remains vaccinated against this disease. So I've now, now told you that rabies is preventable. We've had a vaccine around. The vaccine's in fact been uh, available for over a hundred years. Um, rabies has been known for thousands of years. In fact, there are records dating back to about 3000 BC um, and in ancient Greek times also of records of rabies. So why is this disease still a problem? Why haven't we eliminated, eliminated it? And why is it still a neglected tropical disease? So rabies um, elimination relies on, on three main things. Um, that is awareness and education of, of the communities. Uh, dog vaccination, as I mentioned, so vaccinating those, those at-risk dog populations and then timely treatment and care. So receiving your post-exposure prophylaxis if exposed, and also receiving your pre-exposure prophylaxis for those high-risk groups. Again, these are things that you'll hear about later in the webinar, um, but these are the, the things that we need to address to eliminate the disease. And that brings us to um, why we are here today, why we are hosting this webinar. And that's because we are celebrating World Rabies Day. So World Rabies Day, is on Tuesday, September 28th, and this commemorates the, the day of the death of Louis Pasteur, who was the person who invented the first uh, rabies vaccine. And as Rich mentioned in the beginning, um, this year's theme for World Rabies Day is facts and not fear. And hopefully now that's, that helps you to, to uh, clarify in your mind why I started off with these um, comparisons between zombie movies and with rabies in, in real life is because I wanted to address and highlight that there are many facts about rabies, things that we need, that we know, and there are also many misconceptions, many myths about rabies. Um, one of them being that rabies will turn you into a zombie. So it's extremely important for us to address these myths and misconceptions and replace those with facts about the disease to make sure that everyone is aware of how we can eliminate the disease and that we can make elimination possible. So we have the tools, we have the vaccines, uh, we have all the resources available, but now we need people to, to join together to be aware of the disease and make sure that these things are implemented to make sure that the animals are protected and to make sure that they are protected themselves. Um, so, so that's why we've come here together to celebrate World Rabies Day and to, to help raise awareness about this disease. So I'd like to thank you, first of all, for joining us on this webinar. And I think I've, I've hopefully provided you with a little bit of an introduction, at least to World Rabies Day, but also to the global situation about rabies. 
And now we're going to, to start zooming into to the US specifically with the experts from the USA, um, who will then give you a bit more feedback and uh, specific information about rabies in the USA. So thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Rich. Thank you, Dr. Scott. That was a great overview. Um, and we're gonna go to our next speaker and who is uh, Dr. Ryan Wallace. Dr. Wallace serves as a World Health Organization expert consultant for rabies and is the director of the CDC's OIE Rabies Laboratory. And Dr. Wallace has worked extensively with international organizations to develop humane methods of animal control and effective vaccination practices in free roaming dogs. And he spends the majority of his time um, focusing on the implementation of surveillance systems in low resource countries and improving our understanding of how interspecies relationships impact the spread of rabies. So I'm really looking forward to Dr. Wallace's talk. He always gives a great talk. And I'm gonna turn it right over to you, Dr. Wallace. Are you with us, Dr. Wallace? Looks like you may have frozen. Might have to wait to reconnect. Assuming you're trying to get back on board. Terrence, is there a way to see if um, Ryan is still linked up? It is showing that he's online, um, but I think maybe maybe we can move across to the next presentation and then hopefully catch up with Ryan uh, after that. Okay. So we'll move on to the uh, next speaker um, and Dr. Gilbert is a research assistant with, sorry, a research scientist with the United States Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services, National Wildlife Research Center. She earned her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee, studying rabies virus ecology in North American bats. Her current research focuses on the ecology and spillover of wildlife rabies, as well as the development of applied tools and methods to support oral vaccination programs for wildlife rabies prevention and control. And I also know that Dr. Wilbert, Dr. Gilbert gives a great uh, talk as well. So I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for adapting quickly, Dr. Gilbert. Yeah, sure, happy to do it. Thanks, um, hope everyone can hear me okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm really happy to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you about facts uh, on bat rabies, particularly in North America and the United States. Let's see here. So this graphic shows you the 18 different viruses that can cause the disease we call rabies. But what I want to draw your eye to particularly is that rabies virus is only found in bat populations in the New World, that includes North, Central, and South America. <clears throat> and we also know that human and animal um, rabies vaccines protect against all of the different variants of rabies virus that might be found in bats and carnivores. As was mentioned in the earlier presentation, rabies virus infection of the nervous system is fatal. This is true for warm-blooded animals, but it is also true for bats as a warm-blooded animal and an important reservoir of the virus in nature. 
In North America, several insect-eating bat species serve as natural reservoirs of rabies virus infection. That means that the virus is maintained naturally in those populations. But many other species can be infected and serve as vectors of exposure to humans and pets. So there's over 1,400 species of bats around the world, and we can proudly um, know that there's 47 of those species of bats in the United States of America. Most of those species consume insects or are insect eating. And we also know that insect eating bats provide benefits to agriculture. So in this graphic on the right, I'm showing you a picture of a uh, corn earworm moth, and there's very good evidence suggesting that bats, particularly um, free-tailed bats in the southern United States, eat a substantial number of these corn earworm moths, which are pests for corn crops, as you can see here. And it's been estimated that bats may save farmers in the United States roughly 23 billion, with a B, each year by reducing crop damage to um, important crops like corn and cotton. And through eating insects, it reduces the need for pesticides. We also know that there are substantial threats to bat populations in North America. And here in this slide, I'm just showing you one of those threats, which is a disease uh, present in bat populations. It is not a zoonosis, but it significantly impacts bat populations. And it's called white nose syndrome. It's caused by a fungus. And you can see it emerged um, on the right panel here where that red X is located is where white nose syndrome emerged back in 2006. And every year it has steadily marched westward and spread north and south from that location. And in doing so, it has caused significant population declines in several species of bats. We also know that vampire bats are a reservoir of rabies virus in Latin America. Um, for, for the purpose and context of today's presentation, we're gonna focus on Mexico and that part of their distribution. Vampire bats can infect cattle and humans uh, and other animals with rabies virus. And they occur in Mexico. You can see this uh, shown by the red dots on the map, our occurrence records. And models predict uh, that there is currently suitable habitat that can be found in southern Texas and southern Florida but that there is definitely a potential for expansion north of this range with increasing temperatures. In this map, I'm showing you the distribution of different um, carnivore rabies viruses. So in particular, we have the raccoon rabies virus distribution shown with green. Uh, we have skunk viruses shown with blue and yellow and brown. And we have fox viruses shown with purple in Alaska and also um, orange in Arizona. And why this is important is because the rates of human exposure to rabies viruses of wildlife are lower in states with bat rabies only compared to states that have any of these carnivore rabies viruses that I just mentioned. So the states with only bat rabies in this picture are shown with white. And this is a, a county level resolution map. There's an annual average of over 26,000 bats that are submitted every year for rabies testing in the United States of America. And 6% of those are rabid. And annually, on average, there are one to two human rabies cases associated with bats in the United States of America. And in this graphic, um, it shows five-year snapshots of the number of human rabies deaths dating back from 1960 all the way up until 2018. And what you can see is that prior to the 90s, 
there were most cases uh, being caused by dogs either within the United States or um, acquired somewhere else uh, from another country. But moving forward since about 1991 to present, the overwhelming majority of human cases of rabies in the United States are associated with bats. So human rabies cases associated with bat viruses has, have been reported from many areas. You can see um, a schematic of that shown in this panel of different states and the relative number of cases um, that were summed, I believe, over about a 30-year period. And what's also interesting here is that the bats that are most often associated with human cases include Brazilian free-tailed bats. Those are shown in the map. Their distribution is shown with blue shading here, and it actually extends further south. Silver-haired bats, which are shown with the diagonal hatching here, and that extends fully across the U.S. And tricolored bats, and their distribution is shown with the dotted hatching. So you can see that the presence of these three species also um, seems to be associated with the occurrence of human rabies cases. So contact that can lead to transmission of rabies virus includes bites and scratches. When we're talking about bats, these bites and scratches are often small and they may be easily overlooked. But if the bat can be safely collected and tested, this can inform the need for post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. And here I'm showing you pictures of big brown bats, which are one of the most commonly submitted bats for testing. Um, so that is to say one of the most common bats that comes into contact with humans and, and pets. Uh, and on the right, I'm showing you the tricolored bat. <clears throat> and this is one of the species that is more often associated with human infection. As was mentioned by an earlier speaker, human rabies is 100% preventable by vaccinating pets, avoiding contact with wildlife, and seeking medical attention as soon as possible after being bitten or scratched by a bat or other wildlife, particularly warm-blooded animals. Post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP, for most previously unvaccinated persons consists of a four-dose regimen. That includes vaccine injection on days 0, 3, 7, and 14. But then on day zero or up to day seven, it may also include infiltration of rabies immunoglobulin into the wound. And that serves as a passive immunity until the body is able to mount its own immune response to the vaccine. So that is all I have for today um, on the topic of bat rabies and exposures. But I would encourage you to visit these websites if you're interested in additional information on this topic. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. That was perfect. And this is what we need. And thank you for pivoting and being available. And uh, I see that Dr. Wallace is back online. We, we're happy to see you and uh, glad that you're going to be able to still give your presentation. And um, again, I had already just introduced you once, but I will say that you, Dr. Wallace works with the CDC and uh, he has a lot of great information to share with us. So back at it. All right, thanks Rich, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, we can. Good, all right, thanks everybody. Sorry for the little technical issue earlier. So I'm gonna talk about rabies in the United States. Uh, before I get into too many of the details about what rabies looks like here in the U.S. There are a couple of terms I want to make sure we all understand because they are foundational to how we understand what rabies looked like 200 years ago in the U.S. and what it looks like today. Uh, so the first term is a reservoir species. And this is an animal that is able to maintain the virus within its population. 
So if we use an example of uh, the east coast of the United States, our rabies reservoir species is the raccoon. And that raccoon spreads the virus uh, to other raccoons and, and transmission continues throughout that population. For rabies, even the reservoir species will die, uh, but they live just long enough to spread that virus to other raccoons or other, other animals in their same species to allow that virus to remain on the landscape. But another important term is cross-species transmission. So rabies can infect any mammal. So those raccoons don't keep it to themselves. If that rabid raccoon bites a skunk or a fox or a dog or a person, they can still become infected and go on uh, to develop rabies and die. Typically, they won't spread the virus uh, any further, or at least not too much further, if they're not a reservoir species, but that can change. And so the third term that's important is called a host shift event. And this is where uh, the, there's a change either in the virus or in the animal population that allows that virus to now spread in a new species. And Clearly, this can have major impacts on rabies in the United States or anywhere in the world. Uh, and these are the types of events that we try to keep very close track of so that we can either prevent them from happening or at least identify them relatively early to get the correct animal health and public health messaging out. Okay, so that's that's the background, that's the homework. Now that we know those three terms, we can start to understand uh, rabies in the United States a little bit better. So in the United States, we have five terrestrial mesocarnivore reservoirs. They're shown on the left there. So we have the, uh, the gray fox, the Arctic fox, raccoon, skunk, and mongoose. And then we have numerous bat species that are reservoirs for the rabies virus as well. And like I mentioned before, these reservoir species don't keep the virus to themselves. They like to share it. Uh, and so any mammal is susceptible, but what we see in the United States are quite a few of our domestic animals that are exposed to rabies every year. Uh, around 50,000 dogs, cats, and livestock are euthanized every year, either because they've had a rabies exposure or because they are suspected to have rabies themselves. It's a big number. And then around 400 of those domestic animals will develop rabies each year. Um, and it's not just the animals that we need to be concerned about. People are mammals as well, and so people are exposed to rabies virus. Each year in the United States, about 60,000 people have to get treated for suspected rabies exposure each year. Luckily, we have a very robust animal health and public health system in the United States that recognizes, is able to recognize the majority of these exposures and ensure that those people get appropriate post-exposure prophylaxis, or their, their rabies vaccines. Uh, unfortunately, there are still a few people every year that are not, either they themselves do not recognize the exposure or they don't realize that rabies is a concern and you need to get vaccinated and they, they do go on to die. And we see between one and three human rabies deaths here in the U.S. every year. So one of the issues is that uh, we don't have many deaths, but we still have a lot of exposures and we have a lot of rabies in the United States. And rabies in the United States has been changing throughout the years. If we went back in time to the 1800s, early 1900s, rabid dogs would be found in almost every state. Uh, as we move into the 1960s, like the map on the left there there, there, there were some shifts and we start seeing a bit more wildlife. And then the most recent map is shown on the right. And with a, a much more improved surveillance system now, we can be very, very clear about where rabies is found across the United States and which animals it's associated with. So let's start uh, back at the origins of the modern rabies program in the United States. We have to go back to 1938, and that is when rabies first becomes a reportable disease. And it's kind of hard to do control efforts or monitor 
something if no one has to tell you when it occurs. So the foundation of, of our rabies program and our surveillance program starts right here, 1938, when rabies becomes reportable. Shortly after that, uh, the United States took on uh, a, a massive national dog vaccination program. Uh, this is both through, through campaigns operated by states and local health departments, as well as laws that require the compulsory vaccination of domestic animals. And this was incredibly successful, and we saw significant declines both in dog and human rabies cases after these vaccination programs were implemented. And then up into the 1970s, uh, the, the canine rabies virus variant, the, the variant that spreads between dogs, was eliminated from the United States. Got a little asterisk there because it actually came back in the form of uh, rabid coyotes that had this virus. And we had to uh, do more vaccination and get rid of it a second time. This figure here shows that evolution of rabies in the United States starting in 1950. And if you look at the dotted green line, that's our domestic animals. Those are our dogs primarily. And there's a drastic decline as those vaccination programs start being implemented. But in the solid black line, what we see is a, an upward increase, and that's our wildlife. So between improved surveillance and recognition, and possibly some changes in epidemiology, um, wildlife have been growing in number, ra ra rabid wildlife, whereas our domestic animals have been shrinking. And I also want you to note, I said we eliminated the canine rabies virus variant from the United States, but that green line never goes down to zero. And that's because of spillover. So even though we don't have the virus that spreads really well between dogs, our dogs are still infected each year if they're unvaccinated and they make contact with rabid wildlife. This status of canine rabies free in the United States is a really important one and one that we have quite a few uh, rules and re regulations to maintain. And you'll hear about that in a later presentation. But this took us about 80 years to get rid of this virus. It has prevented nearly 500,000 human rabies deaths during that time, and it cost over a billion dollars. So it is, a, it is a status we want to maintain, and it is definitely not a rabies virus variant we want to come back into the United States. Now, everything I've shared with you before and everything I'm about to share with you is rooted in our national rabies surveillance system. And, it, and, and I want to explain that in a little bit more detail. So most of our information comes from our passive public health surveillance system. This is the traditional system where if you're bitten by a bat or a raccoon or a dog and you go to your hospital, they're gonna get the health department involved. They're gonna assess that animal. It might be tested and those results come to our national program. That system in the United States is operated by over 130 rabies diagnostic laboratories that test 95,000 samples every year. That, that passive public health surveillance system has a lot of gaps because it's only gonna give us surveillance where people are bitten. And so the USDA operates an active surveillance program where they go out to areas where we're doing active management or where we have gaps in surveillance. And they test between five to 7,000 samples in these key areas using a slightly different methodology. This slide shows how all of those systems come together. And so the vast majority of what we know from surveillance comes from the, that uh, very robust public health surveillance system. They're testing around 95,000 animals a year. Around 4,000 to 5,000 are confirmed positive. And then that data is shared with CDC. And then USDA is testing five to 7,000. Around 200 are positive. And then CDC and USDA share that information for one national record. And this is used to both inform EEP decisions and management decisions as well. But the last part of my presentation, I'm gonna really hone in on why you should appreciate your national rabies surveillance system. And I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, but the first one is, should already be fairly apparent. It, we use this information to decide if you need to go get PEP after an animal bite. Uh, a rabid rac or a raccoon in 
uh, on the West Coast is a very different risk than a raccoon on the East Coast where they're a reservoir. And understanding how the epidemiology of, of rabies can really help inform these risk assessments. Uh, we also use it to determine where enzootic areas and regional patterns of rabies are occurring, uh, detecting natural changes, and then detecting unnatural changes. I'll explain that in a minute. And then evaluate our health interventions. And I just want to point out uh, pretty much everything I've shown and what I will show is published every year in the Journal of, Ameri of the American Veterinary Medical Association as an annual surveillance report. So we've put out a very detailed report of what we have seen for rabies in that year. So the first, first two of those benefits, uh, 60,000 Americans get post-exposure prophylaxis every year because of a suspected rabies exposure. Uh, this number could be a lot higher if we didn't have good surveillance and good public health systems. There are an estimated 13 million Americans who are bitten by an animal every year. Through a biogeo-behavioral risk assessment process, we're able to decide if that person actually needs to get PEP. At the end of the day, it's around 60,000 people that go through this evaluation and are deemed at risk and get that vaccine. Really important that we do a risk assessment because the vaccine is relatively expensive, usually between three and $6,000 for the vaccination series. Although in the, the news article I, I'm showing on the screen here, that number can be quite a bit higher depending on where you go and what your insurance policy looks like. That 60,000, those 60,000 exposed Americans, the, the full healthcare costs associated with that, is around $358 million to, to those people, to those insurance programs, to those hospitals every single year. Again, a lot of people think rabies isn't that big of a deal in the United States because we have so few deaths and we eliminated the canine rabies virus variant. That is in fact a very big myth. Rabies is here very present on the landscape and still exposing tens of thousands of people every year. Uh, and Anybody who, who doubts what I just shared, uh, do a Google News Alert uh, update. You, you can get the, the rabies stories automatically sent to your email every day. And every day there's something interesting that is being reported from the United States for, for rabies. Uh, here's one where a bat, a rabbit bat was found at a basketball game. This is an NCAA game. Uh, here's, here's a pretty interesting story of a woman who was gardening and a rabid raccoon wandered out of her garden and started attacking her. She credited her Tai Chi skills to being able to subdue the animal until a neighbor was able to come and kill it and it later tested positive. There is a great story, a, in retrospect, great story about a, a bar in Arizona that propped the door open on a very warm night and a rabid bobcat wandered in and bit a whole bunch of people inside the bar. Uh, and then uh, groundhogs are actually a bit of a surprise. Very cute, very social animals. A lot of people pick them up and a lot of groundhogs end up testing positive for rabies. So there's always a good rabies story every day in the United States. If you don't believe me, check out the, the, the news alerts. Third reason for why we have uh, should have national rabies surveillance, to detect natural changes. Animals are constantly moving and viruses are constantly changing. And so every one of these reservoir species we have in the U.S. originated from a host shift event. Bats gave it to raccoons. Dogs gave it to foxes. Uh, and these things are constantly occurring and, and we need to watch for them. And then we have unnatural changes. So people like to move animals around. And that resulted in one of the largest animal disease outbreaks in the world when someone moved uh, an infected rabid raccoon from Florida into the mid-Atlantic region, which led to now what we know today as the, the Eastern Raccoon Rabies Virus. And people are doing this all the time. People are bringing dogs in from other countries that have rabies. We have people moving rabid cats around the country. And uh, this is something that our surveillance system picks up and we take very seriously and investigate. All right, last little part here, so I'm almost out of time. But uh, you know, the message, what, what can you do uh, as an audience member to keep rabies at bay? Uh, so the first thing is enjoy nature, wildlife, appreciate bats, very important part
part of our ecosystem, but do it from a distance. If you have an interaction with one of these animals and someone suspects rabies, it's not just you that will need to go get those shots and possibly pay that expense. But that animal is almost certainly going to be euthanized and tested. And so this, this keeps you safe. It also keeps those animals safe. You do have an exposure, get vaccinated. Uh, we don't have many human rabies deaths here, but recently there have been a few where they knew they were exposed, but they didn't think it was that serious and they didn't get vaccinated. So um, if, if you've been recommended, you, don't, you, you wanna take that recommendation seriously. You need to go get your vaccines. Report strange acting wildlife to your health department or animal control. Um, if you see something odd in your neighborhood, report it. If you can get that animal removed before it bites someone, you've just saved them a pretty big expense and four hospital visits. And most important, keep your pets up to date on vaccines. Uh, a, a lot of animals in the United States are euthanized because of suspected rabies, largely because they're not vaccinated. And that's probably the easiest thing you can do. See your veterinarian regularly and get those, keep those animals vaccinated. This is my last one. Know who is keeping you safe. There is an incredibly robust, but um, uh, decentralized rabies system in the United States. And it takes a lot of partners. It's our pet owners, our veterinarians, our animal control officers, biologists, um, our, our medical departments, our laboratories, and, and people like me, epidemiologists that spend a lot of time in front of a computer. It takes all of these people working together, sharing information, sharing data, to be able to give a talk like this and publish those reports and give medical advice. All right, so there, there is still a lot of rabies in the US. We're lucky we got rid of canine rabies, but the, the game's not over. There, there are still everyday risks to most people in the United States. And the rabies epidemiology is constantly changing and that can have economic and health repercussions. So we need to keep track of it. Canine rabies took a lot of time and money to get rid of. Uh, and we don't want it back. So our importation policies are really important. Uh, and then our extensive surveillance system, it saves lives and it saves money. And we need to make sure we continue to support those people, especially in the field level, to be able to perform these critical services. And uh, with that, Rich, I think it is back to you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Excellent presentation, uh, very much appreciated. Now we're going to move into uh, the Q&A session. And to chair our Q&A session uh, is Dr. Peter Costa. Dr. Costa is the medical affairs lead for the Bavarian Nordic in the US. He's a public health practitioner, a certified health education specialist, and an honorary member of the American Veterinary Epidemiology, Epidemiology Society. In addition to his work with the Bavarian Nordic, Peter volunteers with the nonprofit One Health Commission and the Rabies in the Americas Committee. His true rabies passion is the public health management of humans at risk with particular emphasis on awareness and education strategies. And so uh, we're gonna be looking at the uh, questions that have been posted in the question box and, and Dr. Costa, take it away. Yep, thank you, Dr. Chipman and hi everybody. Happy early World Rabies Day. We do have uh, a few questions in the chat window so far for the presenters. Uh, certainly, we'd welcome them to come back on camera for the question and answer session. And I would remind the audience that if you do have questions that you'd like to ask to go into your question queue to post your questions for the presenters. So we're going to go ahead and get started right away. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. And actually, the first question here is actually for Dr. Dr. Amy Gilbert regarding bats and the, the famous bat in the bedroom. And if you could just give some guidance on the need for post-exposure prophylaxis when these situations occur. Sure, thank, thank you for the question. Um, and this is an important scenario to be able to highlight and speak clearly about. So thank you for um, whoever had asked this question. So it is true that contact may occur unknowingly if a bat is present in a room with a young child or a mentally impaired person, um, which could include a child or a person under the influence of medication, drugs, or alcohol, or even a person who is asleep. So in cases where 
unrecognized contact might have occurred, persons should assume that they have had a potential exposure to rabies if the bat is not available for testing and seek care from their medical provider. I hope that answers the question. Yep, thanks, Dr. Amy. And before you go, maybe on that same topic, um, regardless of, of bites or scratches, or is there a risk for any kind of uh, skin, skin openings or mucosal uh, exposure? Yes, this is another great question and, and important clarification. So contamination um, of unbroken, I'm sorry, contamination of broken skin or the oral mucosa is a potential route of exposure to rabies virus. And so um, if there is saliva from a bat that has contact with broken skin or the mucosa, this is considered an exposure as well, but is less frequently observed than the bites and scratches that were mentioned on the slides. Yep. Thank, thank, thanks, Amy. Next question is for uh, Dr. Wallace. And Dr. Qu Wallace, the question here is around um, protective titers, both for, for, for humans and, but maybe also for animals. And we see documented, uh, well-documented titer levels of being somewhat protective at or above 0 0.5 IUs per ml. But is there any kind of measure like this for animals? Yeah, so the, I guess the first important point is we try not to say um, protective titer. Titers can change over time and any titer you get from a lab, whether it's for you or your pet, it's a, it's a snapshot of one point in time. Uh, what we do know in people and animals is that if the titer is above 0 0.5 international units per ml, a little science -y, but 0 0.5 is what you'll probably see. If it's greater than 0 0.5, it's almost always associated with survival if you are exposed. Um, and, and so that, that is the minimum threshold that WHO looks for. Uh, in the United States, the recommendations might be changing over the next year. It's being debated right now, but we have a little bit lower threshold in people because the diagnostic methods are a little bit better. Um, and say, stay tuned for uh, the updated ACIP recommendations from CDC next year, and there should be more clarification on the human titer issue. Um, the uh, protective tires. Was, Pete, was there a second part to that question? No, it was. It was really um, to to ask about a, pro a protective titer for humans and for animals. Yep, I think that answers it. Thank you. Uh, but there, there's another. There's additional questions here for you, Dr. Wallace. Um, and the next one is whether or not you could talk about. Um, the success uh, of, or maybe, or Amy or Rich even, regarding the oral vaccine um, vaccination program and the success of the ORV program in the United States. Yeah, I'll let Rich tackle that one if he's still on. Rich, are you there? Uh, I am. And um, there's going to be lots of, uh, uh, Kathy Nelson will be um, discussing that the oral vaccination programs in her talk at, at the uh, she's in the final speaker as part of this um, webinar so I'd like to, to kind of postpone the answer to that question not to steal her thunder because she's going to tell the, the whole story that's right that's right thanks Rich okay Dr. Wallace another question here regarding um Reservoir species. Uh, we we're talking about reservoir species, and you know, do those species live longer after being infected with rabies, uh, for example, than other species of mammals? Yeah. So the, the the very short answer to that is we don't know. Rabies virus can infect any mammal, so you can imagine the number of studies that would need to be done to give a, a universal answer to that. In general, reservoir species are good reservoirs for two reasons. They live a bit longer to be able to shed, and the virus gets to the salivary glands a little bit quicker. And it's a very fine balance there to be able to spread that virus just enough times to keep that, that infection propagated within your species. And if that balance is just a little bit off, the virus dies out pretty quickly. Um, it's called the reproductive ratio, which people have probably seen for COVID quite a bit, the reproductive ratio for rabies cases is actually really low. So somewhere between about 1.2 and 
1.8, means that on average, these animals aren't infecting too many other animals to keep it alive in their population. Yeah, a really interesting question. Um, next one here is for Dr. Going back to Dr. Gilbert, and uh, this was a similar question I had too. Um, in your slides, we showed, or you showed the increase of uh, rabies in bats in the early early 90s. And um, do you happen to know what the reason was for that that dramatic increase? I think it was maybe 1990, 90, 91. Thanks. I, I might have to ask for some assistance from my panelists, Dr. Wallace, but. Uh, this was not necessarily an increase in rabies in bats, but this was an increase in the number of human infections associated with bats. Um, but in terms of what were some of the factors driving the increase in the number of human infections associated with bats around that time, um, I don't know if, if Dr. Wallace, you might have some ideas, but I can tell you that there was at least one transplant case um, of rabies infection from bats that led to um, several transplant recipients having um, cases of rabies infection. And so at least in one of those five-year snapshots, um, there may have been several cases associated with that one transplant case. Uh, Dr. Wallace, do you have other ideas? I, I think you probably nailed it. I can't picture the slide exactly that they're referring to, but the, the axis on that slide I'm sure was pretty small. I, rabies cases in the United States for, for at least a decade have really varied between about one and six, with six being uh, the year that, that had uh, the transplant cases. So you could, we could double the number of cases in a year, and it really wouldn't be that unexpected. They're still pretty small numbers. And Peter, if it's possible, um, there was one other question I saw that I, I did want to clarify because it's important, I think, for the general audience, and that was the comment about PEP or, or post-exposure prophylaxis and the timing of treatments. And it is true that it is never too late to get treatment following a rabies exposure. And so the day zero and, and day seven, those are relative to that first day that you go in for treatment. Right, so um, it is possible you would get rabies immunoglobulin um, even if it has been a long time since the exposure or longer than seven days past the exposure event. Um, so those day zero, three, et cetera, those are with respect to the first day of treatment, if that makes uh, it clear. Thank you for, for the question. Yep. Thank, thanks, Dr. Gilbert. And, Gilbert, and um, maybe one last, one at least one last question. I think this one's important because it's practical to, I think, what a lot of people may encounter, and that is, what do we do if we come across, a, a, you know, bats in our house? You know, we try to clean up droppings or we try to remove the the nest or uh, of bats. What about any kind of exposure to bat droppings or urine? Urine? Any kind of guidance for our listeners regarding, uh, you know, kind of this remediation and whether or not that poses a risk of exposure? Uh, hey, you, want to? you can if you want to, or, or I'm happy to as well. I'll I'll kick it off. So uh, the the first thing is, if you have bats in your house, call your health department. There are rules all across the United States about what species can be removed and what time of year they can be removed. Uh, I, I remember one investigation when I started at CDC, uh, a homeowner had decided to block the, they had bats in their attic and they decided to block the exits. Well, they did it uh, during the day when the bats were all in the attic. And what all that did was made the bats really angry and try to get out of the house, out of the attic through the living areas, and they had numerous bat sightings inside of their house over the next week because they blocked the bat's exit. Uh, so it, first thing, call your health department. There are health risks for you that you should be aware of. There's also, you can make the situation a lot worse. And then um, a, a professional remediator is, is almost always, uh, it should, should be one of your first or second calls to, to make sure you're doing it right. Again, you can make the situation quite a bit worse. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is that rabies virus is not commonly secreted or excreted in your urine or feces. And so generally speaking, I think urine and feces represents a very low risk of exposure. 
Yeah, they're, they're, the one other thing to be concerned about with the feces is histoplasmosis. And again, if you call your local health department, they should know that. They'll talk to you about all the risks that are out there. Thanks, Dr. Wallace. Thanks, Dr. Gilbert. And thanks for keeping us on time. Um, it does look like there are more questions in the queue, but maybe we'll proceed on with the uh, webinar. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Rich and um, we'll continue to kind of amass those questions and, and keep uh, moving them on to the end of the end of the webinar. Yep. Great. Thanks. Great thank questions. You. Thank you for the panelists and thank you. Dr. Costa, I think that um, that was a very productive session, and I and I we will have another uh, Q and A session uh, after the next three talks. So I, I look forward to that as well. So we'll go to our next speaker. So the first speaker in our next session is Dr. Florian Leiner. Um, Dr. Leiner is a biologist by training. Uh, after his postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School, he joined MSD Switzerland, where he held various positions in medical affairs. Since 2020, he serves as a product lead in the global medical affairs team at Bavarian Nordic, a company that focuses on the development, the manufacturing, and commercialization of vaccines. And he's going to give a talk that I think will be very interesting about uh, rabies prevention for all of us that like to travel and see the world. So over to you. Hi. In the first presentation of session two of this webinar, we will discuss rabies prevention in travelers. We have heard before that rabies is present in more than 150 countries. The risk level for humans contacting rabies is high in rabies endemic regions in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, including many popular tourist destinations. The good news for international travelers is that this fatal disease is preventable. So if you plan to go on a trip to one of the before mentioned countries, make sure to talk to a healthcare professional about rabies prevention well in advance of your trip. Rabies pre-exposure vaccination might be recommended to you. When traveling, don't touch dogs, puppies and other animals. This goes for strays and pets because in many countries, rabies vaccination of pets is not required. Even healthy looking animals might be able to transmit rabies. Also, supervise your children closely, especially around animals. In case of an animal bite or scratch, act quickly and immediately wash all bites and scratches with plenty of soap and running water. Seek medical care immediately, even if you don't feel sick or your wound does not look serious. Immediate treatment might be needed to prevent rabies. The treatment in case of a rabies exposure is called post-exposure prophylaxis. As seen before, immediate wound washing is required. Also, rabies vaccine needs to be administered as soon as possible. For unvaccinated persons, this requires four to five doses over a period of 14 to 28 days. In addition, the administration of rabies immunoglobulin for passive immunization is required as well. This rabies immunoglobulin is often in short supply and difficult to access in many rabies endemic countries. For some international travelers, it might make sense to get rabies pre-exposure vaccination before the trip. This is also called pre-exposure prophylaxis and importantly does not eliminate the need for additional medical evaluation and treatment in case of a potential rabies exposure. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, however, eliminates the need for rabies immunoglobulin after a potential rabies exposure and also reduces the number of vaccine doses needed in case of an exposure from four to five doses to two doses over a period of three days. Pre-exposure prophylaxis might also offer partial immunity to persons whose post-exposure prophylaxis is delayed. For example, because they are traveling in a remote region without immediate access to healthcare. Luckily, the number of fatal rabies cases amongst international travelers is relatively low. In the period 2003 to 2017, 11 international travel-related rabies cases have been reported in the US. 
While the risk for fatal rabies amongst travelers is relatively low, the risk for animal exposure and the need for immediate treatment in the form of post-exposure prophylaxis is quite high. Of course, an exposure can potentially be life-threatening, and the need for immediate treatment in the form of rabies post-exposure prophylaxis might be seriously trip disruptive. A recent publication showed that the risk of rabies exposure for travelers might indeed be higher than expected. This was a cross-sectional survey study conducted amongst adult travelers arriving from rabies endemic countries at the German International Airport. In this study, it was found that 2% of these travelers, or 1 in 50, had a potential rabies exposure during their trip. Remarkably, only 19% of those exposed sought professional health care, and only 9% received appropriate treatment in the form of rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. About one-third of potential exposures were due to unprovoked animal attacks. So these were travelers that were not petting an animal, but in these cases, the animal attack really happened out of the nowhere. The majority of exposed persons were traveling for tourism. And the most frequently reported main activities of those exposed included spending time at the beach, going for a city trip or a cultural trip. So not necessarily activities whom one would link with a high risk for animal exposure. Another recent publication made use of data from the so-called GeoSentinel surveillance network, which is a sentinel surveillance system of more than 60 specialized travel and tropical medicine sites in around 30 countries worldwide. This study reported over a 12-year period from 2007 to 2018 more than 5,600 travelers who needed rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. This was higher than the reported cases of hepatitis A and typhoid fever amongst travelers in the same time period and in the same surveillance network. So this survey showed that the incidence of potential rabies exposure in travelers was higher than cases of hepatitis A and typhoid fever. This is in line with a estimate by Robert Steffen of the incidence of vaccine preventable diseases in travelers to low income countries. He reported that while the risk for fatal rabies amongst these travelers is low, the risk for rabies exposure, so animal bites in these regions is high and actually higher than the risk for other vaccine preventable diseases such as hepatitis A or typhoid fever. So which travelers are at an especially high risk for rabies exposure? We have seen in the German airport study that outdoor activities might not necessarily be linked to a high risk for exposure. And this has actually been also reported in the review which stated that there is no published data that links outdoor activities to rabies exposure in travelers. And intended travel plans might often differ, differ significantly from actual plans. So people who make activity plans for an urban destination when on holiday can behave spontaneously and actually perform such outdoor activities. This was also shown in a study at the Swiss Travel Clinic where 365 travelers were surveyed pre and post travel. It was found that 20% of these travelers rode a bicycle but did not plan to do so. 40% stayed in a rural zone or with local people, although they did not plan to do so. And almost a third had close contact with animals although they planned to avoid them. And in this survey was actually also shown that about a third of travelers should have been prescribed rabies pre-exposure vaccination before they traveled due to what they reported post-travel in terms of activities. And the majority of these travelers actually did not receive vaccination before the trip. 
there is good evidence for certain risk factors of rabies, for rabies exposure among travelers. And not surprisingly, this includes traveling to Southeast Asia, India, and North Africa. Another risk factor is traveling for tourism and young age. This is partly explained by the high tendency of children to play with animals. Another risk factor is the length of stay of a trip. However, although a longer trip duration is an important factor for the rabies exposure, exposure risk, many studies that have, have actually shown that reported exposures occurred during the beginning of a trip. Uptake of rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis among travelers is unfortunately quite low. It has, for example, been shown in a study that only 13% of US international travelers with an indication to receive pre-exposure prophylaxis actually received it. Some studies have looked at which factors play a role in the refusal of travelers to receive rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis. Some studies have found that a uh, low risk perception is one of the main factors for travelers to refuse rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis. With that, let me summarize this presentation. Rabies is a fatal disease that is vaccine preventable. While the risk of rabies to international travelers is difficult to estimate, potential rabies exposure is likely one of the most frequent health threats to international travelers. Rabies pre-exposure vaccination simplifies the post-exposure prophylaxis vaccination schedule in case of an exposure and also eliminates the need for rabies immunobobulin treatment, which might not be available in many rabies endemic countries. Rabies pre-exposure vaccination might be recommended for travelers who are likely to come in contact with animals in areas where dog rabies is endemic and where immediate access to appropriate medical care might be limited. If you want to learn more about rabies and rabies prevention in travelers, please visit the website by CDC. I, would, I was just saying, Florian, that that was an excellent presentation and very helpful for all us travelers. Um, all right, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Emily Paracci. Dr. Paracci is a veterinarian and the zoonosis team lead in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the CDC. She's worked on canines rabies elimination projects in many African and Asian countries, and now focuses on preventing canine rabies in the United States. She's gonna be talking about uh, protecting us from dog rabies and, and a little bit about dog importation and border control. So over to you, Emily. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Emily Parachi, and I'm a veterinary medical officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. Today I'm going to be talking about CDC suspension of dogs from high-risk rabies countries. But first I want to thank the Global Alliance for Rabies Control for inviting me to speak at this year's World Rabies Day webinar. Within the CDC, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, or DGMQ, works to prevent the introduction, transmission, and spread of communicable diseases into the United States. DGMQ has officers stationed at 20 airports in the US, and we provide remote support at more than 300 ports of entry in the United States. The Zoonosis team, which is the team that I am a part of, uh, sits within DGMQ, and our mission is to prevent the introduction and spread of zoonotic diseases, public health concern, to people from imported live animals and infectious animal products. The importation of animals is governed by multiple federal agencies. At ports of entry around the United States, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Customs and Border Protection, and the CDC all work together to ensure the safe importation of animals. 
The importation of dogs specifically is regulated by the US Department of Agriculture and the CDC. The CDC estimates that roughly 1 million dogs enter the US every year. 300,000 dogs come by air and roughly 100,000 dogs enter the US from countries where dog rabies is still present. CDC refers to these countries as high risk rabies countries. Rabies is one of the deadliest zoonotic diseases, accounting for an estimated 59,000 human deaths globally each year. And dog rabies is responsible for roughly 99% of these deaths. Dog rabies was eliminated from the United States in 2007, but dog rabies still exists in more than 110 countries around the world that are shown on this map in purple. The primary focus of CDC's regulation pertaining to dog importations is to prevent the reintroduction of dog rabies, which is also known as the canine rabies virus variant, or CRVV. Now, CDC will deny entry to dogs that do not meet our rabies vaccination requirements when they're coming from a high-risk country. CDC denies entry to roughly 300 dogs a year, but in 2020, uh, we saw a 52% increase compared to the last two years. Now this graph shows reasons for denial from 2018 to 2020, and you can see that falsified rabies vaccination certificates have been a fairly consistent problem. Dogs arrive in the United States with records stating that they're over four months of age, but when CDC veterinarians examine the dogs, specifically their tooth eruption patterns, we can verify that they are actually much younger. When underage dogs are imported, they are not properly vaccinated for multiple diseases, including rabies, and they may present a risk of introducing or reintroducing potential diseases into the United States. Incomplete rabies vaccination certificates were also commonly seen in which vaccination records were submitted without the dog and owner's information, so we had no way to know whether the vaccination record was for the dog that was actually being presented for entry into the United States. We had no way to verify that the dog was in fact vaccinated against rabies. So why are there such high rates of falsified or incomplete documents? We don't really know. Demand for new pets during the COVID-19 pandemic as shelters were emptied and people looked to purchase pets um, online and potentially from overseas is one possible explanation. But it's also possible that the puppy importation trend that we're seeing began before the COVID-19 pandemic and represents a larger issue that's not showing any signs of slowing down. There are reports from the United Kingdom, Canada, and the US that theft and fraud associated with online puppy sales has really taken off in the last few years. Young puppies are sold for more money compared to older dogs. Uh, for example, French Bulldogs, which are a, a popular breed here in the United States, can retail for anywhere between $3,000 and $15,000 per dog. Retailers may be able to keep their overall costs down and boost their profits by establishing puppy mills in foreign countries with fewer regulations and animal welfare laws. The dogs are sold or adopted, often online, for thousands of dollars and flown to the U.S. with falsified paperwork to try and circumvent CDC and USDA entry requirements. If an owner is lucky enough to receive their dog, the dogs will often become sick shortly after arrival. In the past few months, we've had dogs imported that have been sick with distemper, parvovirus, canine influenza, intestinal parasites, brucellosis, and rabies. In June of 2021, a shipment of 33 dogs and one cat was imported into the United States from Azerbaijan. Three days after arrival, one of the dogs was euthanized due to suspicion of rabies, and rabies was confirmed post-mortem. Importation documents for all the animals appeared to be credible and appropriate. The 33 other animals, uh, unfortunately, had already been relocated to nine different states, and all were considered exposed to the rabies virus. The CDC Pox Virus and Rabies Branch and the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine led a multi-state investigation to prevent secondary cases of rabies and prevent the reintroduction 
of the canine rabies virus variant in the United States. We implemented a prospective serologic monitoring protocol to determine the animal's rabies antibody titers before and after vaccine booster in the United States. In their importation documents, all animals had a recorded rabies vaccine with a date of administration within eight months prior to arrival in the United States. The states were able to locate all 33 exposed animals and arrange to perform a pre-booster serum sample and rabies booster vaccination at a local veterinary clinic. Five to seven days post-booster vaccination, an additional serum sample was drawn. The post-serologic monitoring protocol showed that 15 of 32 animals, roughly 50%, had an inadequate rabies titer at importation. Based on five large published studies, the vaccine failure rate after adequate rabies vaccination ranges from about 8 to 25%, depending on the time from vaccination to titer. The proportion of animals with inadequate rabies titers at importation was higher than expected compared to these studies. Following booster vaccination in the United States, roughly a quarter of the animals failed to produce an adequate titer. Because we expect previously vaccinated animals to produce a robust response to booster vaccination, this led to suspicion that there were problems with adequate vaccination at the clinic in Azerbaijan. We partnered with Merck, the manufacturer of the rabies vaccine that many of these animals received in Azerbaijan, and Merck was able to verify that the vaccine stickers were legitimate Merck products and that they did in fact ship these vaccine lots to Azerbaijan. We suspect that improper vaccine practices took place in the veterinary clinic that administered the vaccines before exporting the dogs to the United States. However, our investigation did not uncover the exact source of vaccine failures. It's important to consider that dogs that are imported into the United States from high-risk rabies countries may not be fully protected against infection, which supports CDC's efforts to implement the serologic confirmation after vaccination as part of the National Dog Importation Protocol. On July 14th of 2021, CDC implemented a suspension for dogs entering the U.S. from high-risk rabies countries, which again are shown on this map in purple. CDC took this action to ensure the health and safety of dogs imported into the United States and to protect the public's health against the reintroduction of the canine rabies virus variant. As I mentioned previously, in 2020, CDC identified a significant increase in the number of inadequately vaccinated dogs that were denied entry into the United States from high-risk countries compared with the previous two years. These inadequately vaccinated dogs are not protected against rabies and present a public health threat. Reduced flight schedules due to the COVID-19 pandemic, combined with a lack of safe animal holding facilities at airports, have created unsafe conditions for dogs and airport staff. Dogs have been housed in airline cargo warehouses for prolonged periods, leading to illness and even death in some cases. This suspension will protect the health and safety of both people and imported dogs by preventing the importations of inadequately vaccinated dogs and by ensuring that imported dogs are housed in a safe manner if they are detained for any reason. On a limited basis, CDC may issue dog import permits to persons that are permanently relocating to the United States, such as for employment or education, or to owners of service dogs. Now, dogs are required to have a CDC dog import permit prior to travel. To be eligible for a permit, a dog must have a valid rabies vaccination certificate and provide evidence of vaccination through serologic results from an approved lab. The dog must be at least six months of age and must have a microchip. Dogs are also required to arrive at a port of entry with a live animal care facility that can provide evaluation and treatment should the dog arrive sick or appear unhealthy. To help prevent the importation of zoonotic and foreign animal diseases, CDC recommends that people adopt or purchase pets from a reputable local shelter or breeder. Visit the animal before adoption or purchase, 
as many shelters and rescue groups will evaluate each pet to ensure that they're the right fit for a family. Schedule a veterinary exam for new pets within 10 days of purchase or adoption, and beware of online puppy scams from overseas suppliers. If you do decide to purchase or rescue a dog from overseas, it's important to report any ill dog with a history of international travel in the previous six months to your veterinarian. Veterinarians should maintain a high level of suspicion for rabies, foreign animal diseases, or zoonotic diseases that are not commonly found in the United States if this dog has been recently imported. Report international vaccination records that don't match the age and appearance of the dog to your veterinarian and consider revaccinating dogs with discrepant medical records as the dog may not be adequately protected against diseases such as parvovirus, distemper, and rabies. Ask your vet about your state laws, which may require dogs to be vaccinated against rabies with a USDA licensed rabies vaccine that's not available in other countries. During the CDC's current suspension, we want to identify potential solutions for two of our biggest challenges. The first is the lack of a federal surveillance system established to monitor dog importations. This makes it challenging to collect comprehensive data and monitor diseases associated with imported dogs. The U.S. has minimal vaccination and screening requirements, making it difficult to prevent the importation of rabies and other diseases of public health concern. The second challenge is the lack of federally run quarantine facilities for dogs. Prior to the suspension, the burden to quarantine ill or inadequately vaccinated dogs was placed on state health, state health departments, state vets, or local veterinary clinics to provide housing and care for prolonged quarantine periods ranging from four weeks to four months. And this is not a sustainable long-term solution. So how do we address the challenges with imported dogs? CDC is seeking solution-based comments and feedback. We're participating in discussions with other countries that are facing similar challenges in order to discuss unified international solutions to address dog importation challenges. CDC is and will continue to solicit feedback from our federal and state partners. And we're working to update the dog and cat importation regulation to try and address many of the ongoing challenges. CDC will post the proposed changes on the Federal Register for public comment, and we encourage interested parties to provide suggestions and feedback on how we can improve the dog importation process in a way that protects the health and safety of both people and dogs in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for that great presentation, Dr. Bracci. Uh, we'll move on to our final speaker in this session before the Q&A. It's uh, Kathy Nelson, and Kathy Nelson is a wildlife biologist who's worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services for more than 23 years, much of it focused on the management of rabies and wildlife populations. She's worked with both as a rabies field biologist as well as a staff biologist back in the office, crunching a lot of data to improve our program. She currently serves as the Operations Staff Supervisor for Wildlife Services National Rabies Management Program, which involves overseeing the distribution of millions of oral rabies vaccine baits targeting wildlife each year. Kathy, take it away. Thanks, Rich. I'll be talking about wildlife rabies management in North America, but with a heavy focus on the United States. So you heard from Dr. Wallace earlier that are, there are still about 5,000 cases of rabies in the U.S. each year, mostly in wildlife, and this results in specific variants that are transmitted within that species. 90% of our program is focused on management of raccoon rabies, so that's where most of this talk will be focused as well. The best solution for controlling rabies in wildlife is oral rabies vaccination. There are other ways to control wildlife rabies, but only ORV can be done at the landscape level on a geographic and species scale. The concept is simple. You have an area with rabid animals, and you get out in front of that and distribute vaccine baits, thereby vaccinating raccoons who create a barrier, preventing the spread of rabies to healthy populations. Oral rabies vaccination and the elimination of rabies in wildlife is not a new concept. ORV targeting foxes has been used in Europe since the late 1970s. 
This is what the distribution of rabies cases looked like in 1983. And by 2010, 11 countries in Western Europe where ORV was occurring had eliminated fox rabies. Wildlife rabies management embodies the One Health initiative. One Health is a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach working at local, regional, national, and global levels to achieve optimal health and well-being outcomes, recognizing the interconnections between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. That's certainly a mouthful, but the gist is that wildlife, human health, animal health, and the environment are inextricably linked. You may have heard about this One Health concept during the COVID-19 pandemic. Experts believe SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, originated in wildlife. With this pandemic, we have an increased public awareness of disease management that might help explain our program to the average citizen. The National Rabies Management Program is a science-based program with two major goals. Phase one, to prevent the spread of specific terrestrial rabies variants in the United States, and phase two, to eliminate specific rabies variants at the local, regional, and national level. We have several components of the program, but the big three are ORV, as I mentioned, enhanced rabies surveillance to find and document where cases are and are not, and monitoring wildlife populations for rabies virus neutralizing antibodies after bait distribution, or serology. I'll come back to this in a bit. I'll start by describing ORV. We have several methods to get the vaccine baits to raccoons. Fixed-wing aircraft are used in rural areas and are the most common way we distribute baits. In the areas where urban meets rural, we use helicopters. In the true urban areas where low-flying aircraft of any kind are not possible, we distribute baits by ground methods, either driving vehicles and tossing baits from the window or walking the streets and placing baits by hand. And in very unique situations, we might place a device or a station in a fixed location full of baits and let animals come to it and feed on vaccine baits. All of these methods result in about 10 million oral rabies vaccine baits being distributed each year in the US. This is the largest coordinated wildlife disease management program ever undertaken in North America. And you'll notice that our ORV zones line up with preventing the spread of raccoon rabies. Of course, rabid raccoons don't stop at the international border, so we work very closely with Canada on this issue, who conducts their own ORV baiting. In fact, Canada has been at the ORV game longer than the U.S., but between both countries, more than 262 million vaccine baits have been distributed since 1985. The three Canadian provinces who conduct ORV have all eliminated raccoon variant at some point, only to see it resurface from the United States. The binational cooperation and collaboration on wildlife rabies management is so strong that Canada has donated nearly $3 million U.S. dollars to prevent raccoon rabies in the United States. The work with Canada and Mexico that I'll speak about in a minute is all done under the umbrella of the North American Rabies Management Plan. This document, signed by the three nations in 2008, provides the planning framework for information transfer, rabies prevention and control, surveillance and monitoring, and research between the three countries. Mexico recently became the first country to eliminate dog-transmitted rabies under a new World Health Organization validation process. Sorry. Um, they were able to do this by holding mass vaccination clinics throughout the country over the last 30 years and reducing their dog and human rabies cases to zero. Now that they've joined Canada and the US in eliminating dog rabies, they are beginning to focus on wildlife rabies surveillance and management through oral rabies vaccination. A current collaboration we have with Mexico is on vampire bats. You heard Dr. Gilbert mention earlier that vampire bats may be expanding their range north due to climate change. They've been documented within 35 miles of the U.S. border, and several ecological niche models have showed that when they do enter the U.S., they will likely enter in Arizona, Texas, and or Florida. So why should we care about vampire bats? There are approximately 925 bat species worldwide. Most feed on insects, fruits, nectar, or pollen. Only three of these species are vampires and feed exclusively on blood. And only one of these feeds on mammal blood, the other two feed on bird blood. Desmodus rotundus, or the common vampire bat, feeds mostly on cattle, but also horses, goats, and pigs. 
They have a unique rabies virus variant adapted to them, and even if not rabid, their bite can lead to loss of cattle productivity. Given that they feed daily by biting livestock, where saliva mixes with the open wound on their victim and they live in social colonies, they're very efficient at trans. In some parts of Mexico, rabies kills up to 20% of unvaccinated cattle, resulting in millions of dollars of economic loss. Vampire bat rabies in Mexico is a significant issue, with hundreds of rabies cases confirmed each year. So in 2016, USDA worked with the Mexican Ministry of Agriculture to produce a DVD in Spanish and English target targeting ranchers, livestock owners, producers, and cattlemen to educate them on what to look for related to vampire bats and their bites. More than 1,800 of these DVDs have been distributed on both sides of the border since 2016. Around the same time, USDA implemented vampire bat bite surveillance which equals surveying cattle and looking for signs of bat bites in an effort to find the bats when they reach the U.S. We conduct systematic surveys at 13 sites at sales barns, feedlots, dairy barns, and ranches in Arizona, Florida, New Mexico, and Texas. Since 2016, when we began this surveillance, we've examined more than 800,000 cattle with no evidence of vampire bat bites. I want to thank my friend Dr. Luis Lacona for providing most of the images in the Mexico data in these vampire bat slides. Shifting gears back to the U.S. in our National Rabies Management Program, I've talked about ORV, getting the baits to the target animals, but we also use these other two red circles as metrics for monitoring the success of our program. One of our metrics is post-ORV serology, where we go into areas after we've baited, trap animals, take blood samples, and assess whether or not the animal has antibodies against rabies from eating our vaccine bait prior to releasing them where they were captured after they wake up from the drug. Our other metric involves looking at the distribution of rabies cases in a given area. We do this by finding dead animals that may be road kills or strange acting with porcupine quills in their face, for example. Pull a stem sample because the only way to test for rabies is by using the brain. Conducting an antigen test in the lab where we're looking for rabies on a slide that could look like either of these, depending on which test is being conducted, and ultimately mapping these positive and negative samples to get a sense for where rabies is and is not. All of this program monitoring in the U.S. has led to more than 210,000 animals being sampled in the 20 states where we conduct wildlife rabies management. The oral rabies vaccination we do has led to three major accomplishments in the U.S. The first, as previously mentioned, the elimination of a canine variant that came from Mexico dogs and got into the coyote population in Texas in the 1980s. We've not had a case since 2004 and the U.S. was declared canine rabies free in 2007. The second major accomplishment, the elimination of a unique variant in gray foxes in Texas. We've had no cases since a cow in 2013. And the third major accomplishment, no appreciable spread of raccoon rabies west of our ORV zone. And you can see the steady decline of raccoon rabies cases nationwide since we began large-scale ORV in 1997. You remember again from this slide that we have two program goals. And as we make the leap from phase one, preventing the spread, to phase two, eliminating raccoon rabies, we know that we have significant challenges to raccoon rabies elimination in urban environments where raccoons have higher densities, more food sources, more shelter options, more bait competition from non-raccoons, and it's hard for us to bait good habitats where raccoons may be living and traveling. We integrate research into everything we do, where we study many aspects of our program, but as it relates to this issue of baiting urban habitats, I'll talk about some of the great research that's been going on in Burlington, Vermont over the last few years, where we wanted to learn more about wildlife movement patterns, habitat and home range sizes, among other things. We put radio telemetry collars on 61 raccoons, 23 skunks, and 59 possums. We track these animals daily. The collars emit a very high radio frequency that can be heard when tuned to that frequency. So we track these animals all over the city of Burlington and found them living in abandoned auto shops, underground in sewers, under Connex boxes or shipping containers, under people's backyard sheds, and my personal favorite at Centennial Field, which is a single-A ballpark for the Major League Baseball Oakland Athletics affiliate. You can see inside the yellow circle that this skunk had a hole in the grandstands where thousands of fans watched games every night. 
and the GPS data from her caller showed us where she was most active in the middle of the night, under the bleachers at the concession stands where she probably had access to leftover hot dogs and trash. The data we gathered from these three species showed us their movements, the blue dots, relative to the baits we distributed, the pink dots, and their overall home range, the yellow area. It told us we were not getting many ORV baits into the areas where they lived. We are continuing our urban research in Burlington this year by using trail cameras to determine what animals eat our baits and in what time frame after baiting. And we're also planning to integrate bait stations into our hand baiting to see if we can boost raccoon vaccination rates. As far as the road ahead for our program, we plan to maintain the U.S. as canine rabies variant free, focus on raccoon rabies elimination, declare Texas gray fox rabies elimination, continue vampire bat surveillance in Arizona, Florida, New Mexico, and Texas. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the last two bullets, but they are on the horizon. But what can you do to help us be more successful in wildlife rabies management in the U.S. and North America? You've heard messages already today, but you can never hear them too many times. Vaccinate your pets against rabies. Don't handle strays or wildlife. Don't relocate wildlife as it often relocates disease like rabies. Don't feed wildlife. Don't feed your pets outside. Secure trash, compost, barbecue grills, bird feeders, basically anything you think could be a food source for wild animals. And in our profession, we refer to these concepts or themes as love your own, leave the rest alone, and keep the wild in wildlife. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Kathy. That was excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, we'll move right into the uh, Q&A panel discussion and Dr. Scott is going to be the chair, um, and it's everybody, uh, all the speakers could get back on camera. Um, I think there's quite a few questions uh, in, the, in the question box, so I think they'll be, I still have time for a robust conversation. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks very much, Rich, and thanks to, to all the presenters in the second session. Um, I see, as, as you mentioned, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So thank you to the, the audience for, for being so engaged. Um, it's always great to see that there are questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, one of the first questions to Dr. Ryan Wallace. I think one of the best prepared to, to answer this question. And the question is, if the expected failure to response in dogs ranges from 8 to 25%, why do we not boost dogs sooner than 12 months from the first dose? Yeah, Terrence, can you hear me? Perfectly. Good. Okay. And so our goal when vaccinating an animal is to allow it to have a robust anamnestic response if it's ever re-exposed to a virus or, or a vaccine. And so the anamnestic response is made out of our memory cells and they're not very, uh, they're not very high. So it's easier to explain with a graph, but basically when you vaccinate an animal, it's titers gonna go way up. And within a couple months, it starts to drop. And at that point, it becomes highly variable from animal to animal and even person to person about how high their titer stays. What we do know for rabies is that it doesn't matter how high your titer stays. What matters is that you created those immune cells that will recognize the virus if you're exposed and give you a big boost. Uh, and, and so for, for the specific question related to Emily's presentation, um, we don't expect 100% of animals titer if you check the titer too early or too late after vaccination, which is why you see that range. But that doesn't imply that those animals aren't necessarily protected. Uh, I said I wouldn't use that word, but it's, it's easier. Um, what you need to look at is the second half of her slide, which is what those animals did after they got their booster vaccine. And that's where we saw still about 25% fail. And that is very unexpected and wouldn't happen with an animal that was healthy and properly vaccinated. 
Thanks, Ryan. I think that's that's an excellent response for actually quite a difficult question. Um, so the next question, I think, either um, would be directed to to Kathy or to to Rich Chipman uh, from the USDA Wildlife Services, and this question relates to the the oral uh, rabies vaccine. So the question is: Is there any fear of rabies virus modifying with the oral vaccine being put out in mass quantities? to where the pre-exposure prophylaxis and the post-exposure prophylaxis may not be effective anymore. So I think this is the question that that's basically goes towards the, the safety of, of those oral baits. Over to you. All right, I'll take a stab and Rich, you can jump in if I miss something, but uh, okay. the, license, the licensed vaccine that we use in the US for wildlife has been tested on over 60 species um, through safety trials and, and whatnot. It's a um, modified virus, it's a recombinant, so it's not live rabies in the vaccine. Uh, so there's no way people can get rabies from the vaccines that we put out. And um, yeah, it, it has an excellent track record. It's been um, used since 1990 and been fully licensed since 1992 uh, with, you know, as I said, 262 million doses put out between the two countries um, and uh, really like two adverse events that were, that occurred in people who had a immune, um, immune compromised people that got some vaccine into an open wound. Neither of them, you know, had significant health issues related to it. Rich, I don't know if you want to add anything there. That was perfect. Yeah, I think I think that just that just shows that uh, with those number of doses going out and there never being any sort of um, you know case like that, I think that that shows and gives all the evidence that we need to to understand that these are uh, safe safe vaccines and you wouldn't be rolling them out on mass um, if if they weren't safe. Um, so I think the next question, moving on, um, I think uh, the next question is to Dr. Emily Baracci um, about the, the dog import regulations. So there are two questions here for you. Um, and the first question is, when does the CDC anticipate releasing the new rulemaking notice and comments announcement? Um, so I'll let you answer that one first, and then we'll move on to the next question, um, which is in okay. the Thanks, Dr. Scott. Um, yeah, so CDC is currently drafting the new regulation and we hope to um, post it for comment in 2022. Great, and then um, the next part of that question is, if the Healthy Dog Import Act is passed, will the CDC still need to enact additional requirements for importing dogs from high-risk rabies countries? That's a great question. And um, the answer to that is it depends. Um, it depends on what requirements are included in the final act that gets passed. Um, and the second component of that is just because an act gets passed doesn't mean that it's going to be enforced. And so CDC will be watching very closely to see whether uh, the regulations and requirements outlined in the Healthy Dog Importation Act are enforced. Um, and then from there, we would make a determination about whether or not um, we need to continue our current regulations, whether we need to draft um, more regulations, or, or whether we can um, step back and be a part of the Healthy Dog Importation Act. So don't have an answer on that yet. Thanks, thanks, Emily. But I, I think the, the key to this is that you will keep the public uh, updated through, through the, the various notifications and notices um, that, that are available. Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, so we've got another question here for, for Dr. Lynette uh, about uh, post-exposure and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So the question here is, do you have concerns about the mixing and matching of human rabies vaccine between the US approved vaccine and other countries where the human rabies vaccine is distributed? Um, when is the, the fifth dose recommended? Um, so, so this may be a, a, a question that some others with experience in, in other countries also may want to add on to, but Florian, we'll leave that to you to, to address. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> well, as from the 
from our company side, we cannot really make specific recommendations on that. And our prescribing information of the available rabies vaccines in the US state that you should use the same vaccine for completing a series. Um, however, for example, there's data on providing a booster after free exposure prophylaxis has been performed with one of the other vaccines. And, but there are a few studies that looked at interchangeability um, also with vaccines that are produced, uh, for example, in lower income countries. And those have found that um, this can be done. And with regard to the fifth dose, that should be provided at day 28 as per the recommended dosing scheme that's called the SM scheme. Excellent. But I, th I think the key there is um, depending on, on which country uh, you're you're looking at, the, the schedules are different um, in those different countries. So it's always recommended to, to speak to your local healthcare provider in whichever country you are in. Um, so the next question here, we, we received um, fairly early on in the, the, the um, webinar, and um, this is a question I think, um, Rich, you may be best uh, to answer this. And the question is um, that South Florida has seen an increase in rabies alerts. Who determines the need for another oral vaccine program? So I'm not sure whether you or maybe Ryan would be better to, to answer this question. Well, for us, and, and Kathy, you can jump in too. I mean, it's it's a combination of factors, but we're what we're trying to do is we have we're established a very specific oral reviews vac vaccination zone in order to stop the westward spread. Ultimately, we want to work towards raccoon rabies elimination in the U.S. by strategically moving those zones. So although there's definitely some interest locally, there's some definitely some interest in some states like Florida where we previously had worked. It, we have to be very strategic of where we place those because those zones cost a lot of money and we have to and we want to make sure that where we place them it's most effective in getting us towards the national goal so in florida we certainly like florida has an excellent program they have an excellent public health program excellent wildlife program they've shown interest it's just that we're not quite there yet to where we want to start managing it in in strategically in florida Excellent. Thank you, Rich. Um, I think we've got time maybe for one, maybe two more questions. Um, so I'm going to try and make them quick. Um, the next question I think would be to, to Dr. Parachi again. Um, and we have a, a question following on from the, the CDC uh, import ban. And the question is, if the new CDC rule is targeted for 2022, will there be any, any informal comments listed before that announcement? Thanks for that question. Um, CDC leadership is uh, having discussions about whether or not we can um, offer some sort of town hall to interested parties, um, but we have to be very careful with that because there are uh, rules governing um, what type of feedback and outreach we can do once we have a proposed regulation. So it's something we are working on. Um, we do know that there are a lot of rescue groups and interested parties that would like to offer comment. Um, so we're trying to work with them to provide that opportunity, but we have to be fair and equitable to all. And we also have to make sure that we do it uh, within the legal confines of our regulation. Thanks. Thanks, Emily, for that clarification. Um, I think we've got time for one last question quickly, and that is to, to uh, Florian. And the question is about how much does the pre-exposure vaccine for humans cost? Um, I can't comment from that for the US. I think it's around 200 US dollars per dose, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe Pete can, can add more to that. Dr. Costa, are you still hearing us? Doesn't seem the case. Uh, it's about around 200 US dollars per dose. Great, thanks. Um, I, th I think also in, in um, one of the presentations, um, uh, we saw there was an average of about 200 to 300 dollars per, per dose. But I think in addition, there the, the other considerations, including the, the hospital bills and and 
the other treatments that you need to receive, um, considering you may uh, most likely receive this exposure from, from an animal bite. Uh, Pete, I see that, that you are popping on. Would you like to add on to that? Hey, hey, Terrence. Yeah, no, sorry. I was trying to come on, but it wouldn't let me. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, you actually said it, right? It depends on the cost of care at the specific facilities. But I al I'm aligned with Florian, and he's exactly right. And so are you, right around the $200 mark. Yep, that's correct. Sorry about that. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I see there, there's still questions coming in. Unfortunately, we are running out of time now. Um, we will try to address those questions in, in, in any follow-up um, if possible. Uh, so please, if you do have questions, pop them into the chat and we will follow up with this at the, after the webinar uh, closes. So I'm going to hand back over to, to Rich to, to then give us a few final words and close the session for us. Okay. Well, yes, in closing, I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Most importantly, meetings go much better when you have participants. So I think this was very successful. We hope through this webinar that we've provided you with some science-based information and a set of facts and not fear that helps you better understand that rabies prevention and control activities that are going on in the United States and hopefully provide some strategies to help you protect yourself and your family and your pets. Um, again, if we didn't get to the answers, we're, uh, the answers to your questions, we're going to try to get after after the webinar and, and make sure that we um, address all the answers, uh, all the questions. Finally, I want to thank our presenters. I, I think you guys just did an excellent job. It was so much fun for me to sit and listen and and hear all the, the good stories and, and all the good information. And I want to thank the Global Alliance for Rabies Control um, and the Bavarian Nordic and CDC and, of course, my colleagues at the USDA Wildlife Services um, for their support in organizing this webinar. So with that, that, that kind of concludes today's webinar. And I want everybody out there and all my colleagues here to have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.